Uh, good evening to uh, all of you. Uh, let me welcome you to our webinar on lean accounting and activity-based costing, a choice or blend. We have with us our speaker this evening. Actually, it is uh, good morning to Gary because in the USA it's 7.30, uh, whereas here it is uh, 6 p.m. So uh, we are very thankful to Gary Cookings for being here. And we also have on our uh, panel, we have our uh, moderator, that is uh, Dr. Noan Gunratna, and uh, also Mr. A. N. Raman, who will uh, join us uh, shortly. So as you know, the, uh, we have been conducting a number of uh, webinars for you, and I think this is the second uh, webinar that has been conducted by Gary Cookins and uh, uh, the prominence that we are giving to the uh, costing and management accounting uh, profession. So as you know, CMA Sri Lanka is a national professional management accounting body in Sri Lanka. We have been set up by an act of parliament and uh, members of the International Federation of Accountants, the global body, uh, for the accounting profession. We are also members of the South Asian Federation of Accountants, the regional body for the South Asian region, and of course the Confederation and Asian and Pacific Accountants, the uh, body for the Asian and Pacific region. Yeah. Uh, Today, the, as I told you, the topic is on lean accounting and activity-based costing, a choice of blend, because all of you know that uh, we are more used to the double entry bookkeeping and of course the general ledger. And what you get in that is quite different to what we are going to discuss uh, today. And as uh, the uh, National Management Accounting Body in Sri Lanka, we need to uh, bring to light the importance of the uh, cost and management accounting profession and also the importance of uh, accounting and how it will help the management. So today's uh, presentation will, uh, will address the confusion that management accountants have. There are data, there are debates in the management accounting community about what is the most appropriate costing method. There are rival camps, for example, some lean accounting advocates who create value stream maps, criticize activity based costing. There are passionate advocates of ABC because it provides much greater cost accuracy and visibility to cost drivers compared to the flawed and misleading costs from traditional and grotesquely cost distorting cost allocation methods. So we need to find out uh, who is correct and work in the correct right direction. What is needed is to ask a different question that revolves this dilemma. That question is about how a company might have two or more co coexisting management accounting methods. There can be different costs for different purposes used by different types of managers and employees teams. Today we have with us uh, Gary Cookings, uh, who will uh, presentation and it includes uh, various areas that he has uh, built and worked on what has created interest in activity based costing. How do you design an ABC model? that becomes an ABC system? What are the barriers preventing organizations from implementing ABC? What are solutions that overcome these barriers? What is the purpose and benefits of lean accounting? And how can organizations apply both lean accounting and ABC? So today we are in a very, very different situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we think that this would really give new thinking uh, to our managers, uh, both in financial management and costing areas. So the webinar, we, as I said, will be conducted by Gary Cookings, an internationally recognized expert, speaker and author 
in advanced cost management and performance improvement systems. He is a founder of analytics-based performance management, an advisory firm located in Kerry, North Carolina. Gary received a BS degree with honors in industrial engineering operations research from Cornell University in 1971. He received his MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management in 74. So we are very happy and well, let me welcome Gary. I know I should say good morning to you because uh, you are there. Then in addition to that, of course, we have uh, uh, Dr. Nuan Gunratna, who's there to assist as the moderator. Uh, he is currently based in uh, uh, Queensland, Gold Coast, Queensland, where he's attached to the Griffith University. He's, go, he's from a senior lecturer at the University of Sri Jayawardenepura, but currently uh, uh, based in uh, Australia, where he has gone for his doctorate, and I'm sure that he will come back very soon to provide his knowledge to us. Then in addition to that, of course, we have Mr. Raman. Uh, he is a, a fellow member of the uh, Cost Accountants of uh, India and also uh, from Sri Lanka uh, on our advisory council. And uh, uh, he is a past president of the South Asian Federation of Accountants and someone who's been very closely working with Gary. So I think every time that we have an event, uh, Gary's first choice is uh, uh, to get uh, Mr. Raman to be with us. So I hope uh, he is here by now. I was just trying to check and see whether he has come. Uh, no, I can't see him still, but most probably he would uh, log in. And uh, Dr. Nuan is also a fellow member of our CMA and uh, uh, one who's been closely involved with us and uh, I welcome both of them. So Gary, uh, let, me, uh, let me also welcome all our participants, our members uh, who are present for this. I'm sure uh, that all of you are very keen uh, to listen to Gary and may I now hand over uh, the uh, proceedings to Gary to make his uh, address. Thank you very much, Lakshman. Um, it's a pleasure to present uh, again for you. I've not been to Sri Lanka, but several times I've been to many of the cities in India, Bangalore, Chennai, of course, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Hyderabad. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to visit uh, India. Um, you've get, already described my background. You can see some of the pictures here. Uh, if you're doing the math on my college university uh, graduation dates, I am 71 years old, but I feel like I'm 41 years old. Um, there's a reason those books are there. I think that careers have more to do with luck and circumstances than being smart and competent. And I had a couple of lucky breaks. Uh, one, when I was very young, age 27, I was a division controller for a large manufacturing company conglomerate in the US, FMC Corporation. Um, but after three years of being the division controller, I had the chance to become a uh, plant manager on the factory floor. And I used the phrase, I then had to eat the accounting data I had been serving as the accountant upstairs. And I found much of that information to be at best useless and at worst dysfunctional and misleading. And that was a real wake up call to me to understand there's a big difference between external financial reporting, statutory debits, credits, general ledger, that kind of stuff, and internal management accounting, you know, which is used not for you know, external reporting to governments and shareholders, but internal uh, accounting information for managers to provide insights and make better decisions. But my luckier break was in 1988, KPMG, and you can see I was with Deloitte and KPMG. KPMG struck an exclusive contract with the very famous Harvard Business School professor, Robert S. Kaplan. Uh, many of you recognize his name from the balance scorecard, the Kaplan and Norton scorecard, but he did the early pioneering work in activity-based costing. So I got recruited, I was trained, and for five years I did nothing but implement ABC, and that led to my writing a book, and then the rest is history, a lot more books. Please do not purchase these books. What you can do is go to websites, and the chapter one is usually a, a, a free download, and you can get the overview. So let's get going. Who will benefit from this presentation? Managers who have previously struggled at promoting financial planning and analysis, profitability reporting with activity-based costing, cost management, and lean accounting, 
and integrating them into their decision support systems. Managers who intend to champion any or all management accounting improvement techniques and need a compelling call to action. And the reason I have champion in quotation marks is because it's been my experience that although it's nice for senior executives to sponsor new initiatives and innovation, often they are preoccupied with firefighting and short-term priorities. So it's typically managers that are one, two, three levels down in the organization chart who sort of have passion, fire in the belly and ask themselves, how long do we want our organization to continue to perpetuate using some of these stale or arcane or old methods. And they're the ones that will do a proof of concept or a pilot and demonstrate to their fellow line managers and executives above them, this is the way to go. These are the better techniques. So if you are two, three levels down in the organization chart, I like speaking to you. Whoop. I always start with these three questions. What, so what, then what? So imagine that your organization does implement what I'm gonna describe in the next probably 60 minutes here, and then we'll have some Q&A and discussion and, and feedback from uh, Nuan and, and Ann. Imagine you do implement these, I say celebrate for one day. You are not done. You will see much more information about your organization that you've ever seen before, and some of it will be a surprise. And that will lead to the next question, so what? What's relevant in all of this information uh, in the future, we can talk about the then what, because that's really about decisions in the future, you know, budgeting, rolling financial forecasts, what if scenarios. But for this presentation, we're going to talk about really the, the so what. So my agenda is I'm first going to basically provide a taxonomy of like in biology of the three kingdoms, if you will, of accounting. Then I am going to talk about strategic management accounting that will be about, if you will, profit analysis you know, and then we'll talk about um, even being more strategic about customer profitability. Then we'll move into the lean accounting, which is more operational. At the very end, I'm going to describe a technique to assess the quality of your own accounting system. So let's start with uh, really a description, which Lakshman, I think you read this. So um, I think I'm, I'll just go through it quickly. It'll reinforce what you just read. There's debates about the management accounting community about what is the appropriate costing method. There are rival camps. For example, lean accounting advocates who create value stream maps, they will be critical of ABC, some of them, that has passionate advocates like me because it provides much greater cost accuracy and visibility to the cost drivers compared to the flawed and misleading cost from traditional grotesquely cost distorting cost allocation methods. I'll be describing those in the next few minutes. Who's correct? Well, the point is they're both correct. You know, what's really needed is to ask this different question. And that is about how a company can have two or more coexisting management accounting systems. It's okay. There can be different types of costs for different purposes used by different types of managers and teams. I'm going to repeat this slide in about 30 or 40 minutes, but I just want to give you a big overview. The strategic view starts at the top where you have your ledger. You basically convert those into the work activities and the end-to-end -end processes, and then you calculate, if you will, the output costs, cost objects, products, service lines, channels, customers. See that number one, that gives you the profit margins. It really helps get senior management's attention. You really understand different types of costs. Then my suggestion is now you swing back and you string those same activities that were not connected in time. You string them like pearls in a necklace to get the lean accounting process-based view. We'll revisit this later. Much of what I'm writing in this article comes from a part-time role I had with the Institute of Management Accountants in the United States. I'm a 30-year IMA member. When I retired from SAS, I didn't mention in my career, I did spend 16 years with SAS, the large analytics software vendor, which is in India. Um, I basically wrote many, many articles. And this article is actually one of the seven trends if you go to these links in this particular link. So let's talk about the taxonomy. <clears throat> Just like biology, plant kingdoms, animal kingdoms, there's really three kingdoms in accounting, tax accounting, financial accounting, management accounting, okay? And we start with 
calculating costs. Expenses and costs are not the same thing. You know, expenses are when you exchange money with third parties or pay employees, you know, currency exits the treasury, you calculate costs. But when we basically do external reporting, we follow rules, generally accepted accounting principles. Here in the United States, we've got the Security and Exchange Commission. That's pretty much for valuation, things like cost of goods sold, inventory valuation, if you're a manufacturer. But for management accounting, we don't have to follow those rules. It's basically modeling, you know? So in the historical view, it's about cost reporting and analysis. And then the predictive view, which we won't talk about today, we're gonna to talk about the historical view. That's where we get to decision support and cost planning, uh, you know, budgeting, forecasting and the like. Many accountants do not like me when I describe the value spectrum at the bottom. Notice the very far left is low value add from accounting data. Then we move to the right in the middle, modest value add, and farther to the right, high value add. The value of accounting information shifts from left to right, but many accountants are only doing the financial accounting. So I hope you don't get mad at me, but the value is really not in you know, reporting to the shareholders, it's providing insights to managers so they can make better decisions. Okay, let's talk about what's caused interest in activity-based costing. Mistrust of the managerial accounting system and its lack of visibility of process costs and the flawed cost allocations and misleading cost reporting of outputs, products, standard service lines, channels, customers, and outcomes. Most managers do not trust the management accounting information. You'll know why, they don't like those overhead allocations. But here's an interesting question. Which management accounting system should you use? I'll let you look at that for a couple of seconds. There are many, it's very confusing. In fact, even most cost accountants don't understand what the differences are. But what is important is there are principles and we will talk about universal principles that apply when one's done costing. And here's another part of the problem. The vertical axis is the mathematical skill that one acquires. And the horizontal axis is really this stage in life, you know, children, elementary, school, college. So look, as we go up the curve, you know, algebra, trigonomic, complex functions, and then where are you now? Spreadsheets, you know, you can't just continue to use spreadsheets. You have to use modeling tools. So a little bit of a primer on management accounting we got to distinguish between direct and indirect expenses. Ideally, all expenses should be directly charged, you know, but the problem is indirect expenses are becoming larger and larger. So what I'm showing in this diagram is sort of a spectrum. To the far left, the highest form of direct costing is really project and job order costing, but it only applies when there is non-repeatable work. So it's like a one of a kind or building a satellite. Most organizations who have repeatable, especially in manufacturing, then use standard costing. But I want to be clear, you know, this is apparent, this is applicable to all organizations, including service organizations. In the United States, only one out of 10 jobs make products. The other nine are basically providing services, but it's still universal. ABC is sort of a poor person's standard costing system. It doesn't require all these routings and bills of material that manufacturers use. You'll see how it works. The main message on this slide is to the far right, allocations do not do allocations. And I'll distinguish between allocations and tracing expenses with cause and effect relationships. So a simple way to understand ABC is this. Imagine you go to a restaurant with three other friends. You order a little salad and the other or three order the most expensive item on the menu. And when the waiter or waitress brings the bill, the other three say, hey, let's split this check evenly. How do you feel? Not fair, not equitable. You know, you ordered little and they ordered a lot. You're gonna be subsidizing by splitting the check evenly. Well, that's how products and standard service lines feel in an accounting system when the accountants take this large amount of indirect and shared expense, commonly called overhead, and they allocate it like spreading butter across bread using factors like number of labor hours, number of units produced, number sales amount, head count, full-time equivalents. None of those factors reflect the unique consumption 
that those products and service lines consumed of those end-to-end -end business processes and the activities that belong to them from the salaries and supplies and purchases. So if you were to decompose the overhead into various cost pools and trace them with cause and effect relationships called drivers, you will discover compared to that traditional flawed allocation, some of the products and services are in fact overcosted and the others must be undercosted because it's a zero sum error game. And therefore you're providing flawed and misleading information to your line managers that are doing pricing and strategic decisions. So the simple definition of activity-based costing is this, it's as if the waiter or waitress brings four individual checks. You only pay for what you ordered and consumed. Now, how did I become an expert on ABC? I think I mentioned it already. Kaplan came into KPMG. He had actually written this book in the 1970s, Relevance Loss, The Rise and Fall of Management Accounting. And that message was about why cost allocations are misleading. And that led me to writing this book. So why has ABC become of interest in the last 40, 50, 60 years? It has to do with this diagram. It has the three universal components of any organization's expense and cost structure. The direct recurring repeatable labor at the bottom, the direct material, and then the overhead, which is more properly referred to as indirect expense. And when you ask people, well, why is the indirect displacing the direct over time? Many people think, well, machinery, computers, automation, you know, we're kind of like automating the frontline workers. That is secondary. The main reason this is happening is over time, all organizations have had an increased proliferation of different types of products, different types of service lines. You know, manufacturers have more colors, more sizes, more ranges. Banks have more types of depository accounts and the like. And the point is this. Whenever you increase the diversity and variation of the outputs, it just produces complexity. And complexity causes the need for more and more indirect expense to management. So many years ago, when the indirect was very thin, okay, you could use those flawed allocations because the majority of the expenses were direct. That was accurate. You didn't have that much error, but that's not the case today. Overhead's very big, so the magnitude of the error can be substantial. The problem actually really begins with this traditional responsibility cost center statement. Every manager on the planet Earth recognizes this report, you know, salaries, equipment, travel expenses. The problem is when they get this report, they ask themselves, how much insight do I get about the expenses that I can manage and control and where does it go? And the answer is not much. I always say when managers get this kind of report, they are either happy or sad, but they are not, they are rarely any smarter. What activity-based costing does is it makes them smarter. The way it does it is notice in this diagram, we've converted the 914,000 into the middle. It's the language of work, key scan claims, analyze claims, Notice I'm using the back office of an insurance company. It's a factory too. And then it reassigns each of those work activities into the product service lines, channels and customers using what are called drivers, activity drivers, just like the waiter or waitress in the restaurant with an individual check. It basically provides much greater accuracy. Now, it isn't quite as simple as what I just showed you. I've rotated that previous slide 90 degrees to the left. You just don't say, oh, I take my ledger expenses, I put them into these activity cost pools and I sign them. No, it's not two steps. The, far, the right is much more reflective. It, you've got support activities that support other support activities that ultimately support the frontline activities that interact with customers and make products. It must be a multiple stage cost assignment. Now, I want to warn you, the next slide is going to look complex. I will briefly go through it, but you need to understand how any costing system works. Oh, well, actually, I'm going to set you up. I just want to show you how $70 will take a fictitious $70 of expenses eventually piles up at the bottom. We've got $10 of direct material, 
$10 of direct labor. We have $30 of support activities. We've got $10 to the next right, which is directly to the customers. And then we'll talk about something called infrastructure sustaining. Notice those support activities, they get reassigned. Some of it, $5 goes to supporting the product making, $10 supports the customer activities, 15 to the sustaining. Notice we keep accumulating down. Now we've got 10 and 15 going into the products, that's 25. We've got the 10 and we've got the $20 going to the customers, but the customers buy the product, so that makes it 45. See how it all reconciles. This is how it really works more, if you will, visually. You've got the three universal components of any organization's expense structure. Those, the expenses at the top, the work activity costs in the middle, and they eventually pile up at the bottom into the product services, customers and business sustaining, okay? You need to adjust your thinking. This is not a process flow chart. We'll get to that later when we talk about lean accounting. It's a reassignment network. So if the organization spent, let's say, 10 million euros or dollars, they will basically pile up into the uh, same $10 million of work activities. Someone's got to tell the myth to uh, mute herself. And then it will pile up into the products and customers. Think of all those arrows as thin straws or wide pipes where the diameter reflects the amount of money that flows through it. That's why it reconciles exactly to the euro, to the dollar, to whatever is the currency at the bottom. Business sustaining is a special category to the bottom right. Some of the product costs have nothing to do with making products or delivering services. Like, you know, you closing your department, closing the book. So we put those into business sustaining because we don't want to unfairly overcost the products and services. At the very bottom, Think of this like the predator food chain, you know, like in biology, you know, large mammals eat small mammals, small mammals eat plants. It basically eventually accumulates into the customers. The customers and the business sustaining are the ultimate destination. But here's the, here's, oh, in terms of direct cost, not broken. That's the straight shot. You may have data integrity issues, but that's a different problem you'll need to resolve. The point is this, costing is modeling. Costing is not T accounts and journal entries and debit and credit. You're modeling the consumption of the expenses into the outputs. Now the consequence, the result when one does ABC is very shocking because the magnitude of the error. What this diagram is showing is the horizontal bar is your traditional butter spreading, you know, cost allocations violating the cause and effect relationship. The vertical axis is the magnitude of error. How much error are we talking about? 5%, 10%? On the far left, what we discover is the simple products are the ones that are subsidizing the others. It's like you and the restaurant that ordered the salad. At the far right, it's the more complex products and services that are requiring more and more of that indirect overhead that are actually being subsidized. So the magnitude of the error can be substantial. This slide is much more important because it shows you what is the result when you do ABC and you're looking at real actual data of a true company. The vertical axis is the net revenues minus the properly calculated activity-based costs. The horizontal axis is the cumulative buildup of the profit, but it's rank order from the most profitable product to the second most profitable product and so forth ultimately to the very far right, the most unprofitable product. Notice the very last data point at the right will exactly reconcile with the income statement. So in this company, they had 30 million in sales, 28 at expenses to net out a two. The very last data point was the two. Management team is always shocked. They cannot believe this information because in this case it said, look, you made approximately $8 million of unrealized profit on three-fourths of your most profitable products. You lost $6 million on the remainder to net out a two. And before they saw this diagram, they thought their belief system, it was this little line with a hook on the end. And what was happening is the ABC modeling technique was, you know, was basically detecting all of the diversity and variation. The bad method, the butter spreading method was crushing and suppressing the accuracy. 
the ABC was detecting it to give you the top line. Top line is the truth. The blue line is false and wrong. Now, some of you may be asking, what do I do about those products that are unprofitable to the right? Do I drop and abandon them? No, that could be a mistake. Sometimes you have what are called loss leaders that are associated with winners. And, 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 and cost accounting does a terrible job on product life cycle. New products being released may be in a shakeout period without revenue, so they'll look like unprofitable. But when you refresh the model periodically, every month, every quarter, they'll move to the left. But here's the point. At least this is fact-based data. At least the top line is fact-based data. If you can remember anything from this webinar, remember this. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. But usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So to the degree those executives up top are making decisions on flawed or misleading information, the organization's at risk. Look, here's another one. This organization's actually losing a half a million dollars but they made almost what, 4 million on 60%. So I'm showing this always happens. And incidentally, these two graphs came from my very first ABC implementations with KPMG in 1988. We're talking 40 years ago. So this goes on and on and on. And what this diagram is showing briefly is you can lift that curve by basically taking actions. So the red line, very simplistic, is the without ABC. The line above it is the operational improvement. We'll get that from lean accounting. Be patient with me. In about 20 minutes, I'm going to get to lean accounting. And then we get a higher lift when we do the strategic decisions. There is also more than meets the eye when you look at that curve. That we call it a whale curve because it looks like a humpback whale curve. You know, For those unprofitable products, you get visibility. What you're really seeing here is an example of a single product. Each of those products is reaching up into the work activities and asking how much of each of you did I uniquely consume last period? And it piles them up like pancakes where the thickness of the pancake is the quantity of the driver times the unit level driver cost consumption, right? Like, you know, like number of material moves, number of orders plays, number of blood tests in a hospital as an example. I like this cartoon, and I think it may be embarrassing to some of you who are listening to me, but that here's the truth. The signboard says, here's the answers. The left is simple answer, but it's a wrong answer. To the right, it's, a very com it's more complex to calculate it, but it's more correct. Look where everybody's going. They're going the simple way. It's easy. Yeah, oh yeah, let's allocate the overhead on labor hours, but it's wrong. Most CFOs are taking the left side path. We've got to get people going to the right side. Now, real briefly, very briefly, I just want to clarify, there are other multiple methods. One is called time-driven ABC. I am not a particular fan about it. Um, if you, I will only be brief. If you want to know more information, if you go to my website, see it at the bottom left, bottom left www.garycokins.com. There are many free downloadable articles in the tabs. One of them is about time-driven ABC. But just to really oversimplify, the problem with time-driven ABC is it's based, this is to the right, it's based on algorithms and calculations and formulas. There is no activity module in the middle. You know, as a result, it's confusing. And its real purpose is to understand the cost of unused capacity. I don't think that's a burning platform question for most executives. And if it is, they will see it by sight visibly. They'll see employees taking longer lunch breaks, you know, or what have you. Let's move on. The next part of strategic before we get to lean accounting is basically profitability by customer. The shift from being product centric to customer centric. And to validate why this is important is here's a survey from many years ago of CEOs most important concerns and look at the top two most important, attracting and retaining loyal customers, increasing market share. So here's the problem. The value of any company from its shareholders view is the value that comes from its customers. The only value a company will ever create is the value that comes from its customers, the current ones and the new customers acquired in the future. 
to remain competitive, one must determine how to keep customers longer, grow them into bigger customers, make them more profitable, serve them more efficiently, and acquire relatively more profitable customers like the ones you have today. But we have a bunch of problems because of the CFO. They're not measuring customer profitability. They're stopping at the product gross profit margin line. We'll talk about that in just a second. So what about those other costs? Products and standard service lines are not the only thing for which accountants should compute costs for. What about all the costs that have nothing to do with making products or delivering standard service lines? And I'm using standard service lines for all you service organizations, banks, insurance companies, travel agencies, ones that don't make tangible products. <laughs> the problem with traditional accounting's product gross profit margin reporting is you don't see the bottom half of the picture, you know, below the gross profit margin line. And what I'm going to show you now or tell you now is why the bottom half is much more important than the top half. Visually, what I'm saying is if the entire rectangle here is all your expenses for a period, the product is only the direct material labor and the indirect expense. And it would be nice if the indirect was traced with the uh, ABC principles. But what about distribution, sales, and marketing, and gs &A? What about the channel and customer? The white space is more important. And why? I call this the perfect storm. Why does, if you will, cost to serve matter? I'm going to give you four reasons. The first one, customer retention. It is relatively much more expensive to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing one. That's a no-brainer. That's because existing customers, you already have them. They are a sunk cost. And if you understand decision theory, any decision in the future, you ignore sunk or fixed costs. It's only variable costs. Second, sources of competitive advantage. As products and standard service lines become commodity-like, then the shift is towards service differentiation. And here's the point. Customers are the source of value creation for shareholders and owners. You know, but when every competitor has the same, if you will, roughly direct cost, we've got to move towards service differentiation. Next, customer relationship, one-to-one -one marketing. Pepper and Rogers, these are two gurus in the marketing space, have hailed technology as the enabler to identify customer segments and tailor marketing offers and deals. So they're basically saying work backwards, understanding the unique preferences of customers and have tailor the price discounts, the coupons, the offers, and so forth. Finally, the power shift. The internet is shifting power irreversibly from sellers to buyers. This is a one-time event happening in our lifetime. And I don't mean you at your household buying stuff on the internet. Today, a purchasing agent in a company with a click of a mouse can see 10 suppliers and understand everything about them. So, what I'm really saying is you've got to understand selling distribution and channels. But here's another problem, angel customers and demon customers. What do I mean? Every company will have high maintenance customers and low maintenance customers. Examples of high maintenance customers, always changing the delivery schedule, never buying standard, always special, always calling help desk, always returning goods. Example of the lovely angel customers, only by standard, never change delivery schedule, never call help desk, never return goods. If those two types of customers bought the same volume, the same mix at the same price, they're not equally profitable because the high maintenance, those demon customers are causing you a lot more expenses. Therefore, they're less profitable. Really quickly, I've decomposed the diagram. I'm not going to go through it. Again, if you go to my website, you will find a 30-page white paper that I wrote, SMA, Statement of Management and Accounting for the Institute of Management Accountants in the United States called Implementing ABC. It will describe this. But here's the point. When you bring in each of those drivers from the middle module, the activity module, you're basically de-layering the profitability layer by layer by layer, and that leads to this a profit and loss statement for each customer with all of the profit margins layers like an onion skin. And you'll notice in this fictitious example, this XYZ corporation had a gross profit margin, look to the right, of 30%. But between the 30% and the 8% at the bottom, 
22 more points of margin are eroded, nothing to do with making the product or delivering the standard service, all having to do with marketing expenses, selling expenses, and customer service expense. And if you calculate this for every single customer, you can put them into a grid that looks like this. So each of the circles, each intersection is a customer profitability. The vertical axis is the product mix gross profit margin. The horizontal axis is the cost to serve those angels at the left and the devils to the right. And now things become obvious. Look at the bottom right. It shows you this is the most unprofitable customers because they're buying low margin mix from you and they're difficult to serve. The most profitable customers are in the upper left because they're buying high margin mix from you and they're easy to serve. And now the name of the game is move the dots from the bottom right to the upper left. And that would be a different webinar about what are the actions one takes to make customers more profitable. Some of it would be doing fee-based like the banks have done, charge them individual fees for the special services, cross-selling, upselling, things that the marketing and sales department can talk about. I've now used the same data, but I've used rectangles. I've used squares. So the vertical axis is the profitability of the squares for the customers. The, the horizontal axis is the sales volume. Notice the square to the farthest right. That's the biggest sales customer. But above it are a few other customers and basically more profitable, less sales. But look at the bottom. There's a whole bunch of customers, pretty significant sales. They're unprofitable. Here's the point sales volume is not equivalent to profitability. You need to know that. Briefly, some of you may be saying, Gary, you're persuading me we should be doing activity-based costing, but I know it's too complex and it'll have 3,000 activities and every employee will have to fill out timesheets and people hate timesheets and on and on and on. Those are all excuses, but they're misconceptions on your part. I learned several years ago, you can implement ABC in two to three weeks and it full system. And the technique is rapid prototyping with iterative remodeling. You start with model zero, see to the left, four or five people in a room, cross-functional managers, build a high-level model very quickly. The purpose is not to have any accurate or useful data. The purpose is for the afternoon of the second day, bring in the other line managers and the executives, have them look at what you built and the light bulbs go on for everybody. Oh, that's how we get rid of those allocations. Oh, that's how we could really understand our profit margins. Oh, that's how we can know which customer are more or less profitable. Oh, that's how we could do benchmarking with apples and apples, not apples and oranges, on and on and on. It gets accelerated learning, they understand it. Then you do a couple of iterations, decompose it, get a little bit better, in three weeks to the right permanent, repeatable, reliable ABC production system. Make your mistakes early and often, not later when the system is too hard to change. The reason rapid prototyping works has to do with what determines accuracy. This diagram is showing the vertical axis is the accuracy of the final cost objects, products, services, channels. The horizontal axis is the level of administrative effort to collect the data, validate the data, calculate the data, report the data, you'll always get an asymptotic curve. It'll, the accuracy will increase relatively quickly and then level off diminishing returns on extra accuracy for the extra level of effort of work. What rapid prototyping does, it assures you'll get the black line, the one with the slope going up real quickly. And what's surprising to most accountants is the thing that influences that slope has got nothing to do with timesheets. It's about the multi-stage cost assignment network that I showed you about 20 slides earlier, costing is modeling, and that's what ABC is doing. You stop when you get about 95% accurate. It doesn't have to be perfect, you know? This is management accounting, not internal, not external financial reporting. We have a phrase, it's better to be approximately correct than precisely inaccurate. Don't make it more complex is the higher climb worth the better view. Benefits from ABC, accelerated learning, people get it, solves that thorny leveling problem. People, how many activities will there be? Uh, 3,000, you typically it only needs 40, 50, 60 activities. Most of the ABC got a bad reputation many decades ago because the models were way too complex, way over-engineered, too de detailed, 
They were unsustainable. No one could understand them. And people said, oh, ABC doesn't work. ABC does work. It's just full absorption costing done correctly. Also at that end of that second day, you can ask the managers in the room, when this is done and complete in three weeks, how will you use it? And you get them to basically start committing. They'll use the information. If you want to know more about rapid prototyping, again, go to my website. There's a whole article about it. So here's the point about customer profitability. CFOs must shift from being for sales from help by helping sales and marketing. The spending budget for sales and marketing is critical, but it should be treated as a preciously scarce resource to be aimed at generating the highest long-term profits for shareholders and owners. This means answering questions like, which type of customer is attractive to newly acquire, to retain, to grow or win back? And which types of customers are not attractive? And once you know the ones that are attractive, the next question, how much should we optimally spend attracting, retaining, growing, or recovering each customer segment? And the reason it's an optimization question is look at the subtitle of that Angel and Customers book, Discover Which Type of Customer is Which and Turbocharge Your Stock Price. And the reason this is important is because there are two ways to destroy shareholder wealth. You can destroy shareholder wealth creation, one, overspending unnecessarily on loyal customers for what is needed to retain them. They would have bought all the same stuff anyway, so don't spend extra money trying to basically wine and dine them. But you can also destroy shareholder wealth by underspending on the marginally loyal customers and risk their defection to a competitor where they leave you and then buy from a competitor. It's an optimum spending decision. Okay. You've been all patient, thank you. Let's get now where lean accounting fits in. So there are two views of costing. There's a horizontal process view and a vertical outputs view. I'm gonna read this slide. Managing with the process view has created a growing need for better managerial accounting information. This is where lean management and lean accounting fit in. Managing end-to-end -end processes and managing the work activities that belong to and comprise the processes go together. By defining a business process as comprising two or more logically related work activities intended to serve end customers, the need for integrating processes, outputs, and measured costs becomes even more apparent as an important requirement for managers and employee teams. Money is the language of business. There are two ways to organize and analyze ABC work activity cost data. You've got the horizontal process view, which sequences and additively builds up accumulatively the cost, whereas the vertical cost assignment, which we already discussed as previously described, transforms resource expenses into output cost by continuously reassigning costs based on cause and effect tracing cost allocations. So what I'm really saying here is ABC in this pyramid is strategic. It's the top half. The operational is below. Strategy is about choosing the right things. First, do the right things. Then efficiency, utilization, productivity, taking out waste, cycle time reduction. Next, do those things right. So lean accounting. Lean accounting can coexist with one or more other costing methods. But I do say be wary of ABC zealots. What I mean by that is there are some consultants that are, if you will, they're lean accounting and they are they bash ABC as being bad. They need to stop. Basically, you can do both. Different types of costs for different purposes for different users. And if you want to read my article on this, here is the link below. It's from the, it's from the cost management journal. You'll be able to read a 10 page article. So let's talk about these two views. What I'm showing here now is a simpler view of the cost assignment network. Each of those little X's in the departments, think of those as cost centers, is a work activities. When we do activity-based costing, we're reassigning them as I showed you. Notice how the activities are piling up in the suppliers, types of products, types of orders, types of customers. But we can take the exact same activities and string them like pearls in a necklace horizontally, end-to-end, -end, across the various departments to calculate the process costs. And what that allows us to do is then create what are called value stream maps. And value stream maps are very popular. 
by the uh, operational productivity improvement, quality improvement people, process improvement people. What you're seeing here would be the stringing those same activities that were in the middle module of ABC, but now I've put them into a process flow chart. And the height of the stack is how much money is going into each of the work activity. And then what the lean management people then like to do is they will then tag or score each of the activities as value added or non-value added or moderate on a spectrum. We call these attributes, value added, non-value added. Attributes are like scores. They're like the color of money. They don't change the cost calculation. That's the same amount of cost. They add, if you will, another dimension to the costs, okay? So it really provides this visibility that the operational people can then focus. Where do we have opportunities to reduce cycle time, reduce waste, and so forth? That's where the cost management, cost reduction comes from. Let me talk a little bit more about attributes and activity analysis. Each of those activities can basically go through this quick chart. First, first question, is it required, required by a customer? If it's not, then can we eliminate it? If it is, can the frequency be, be reduced? You know, if we're delivering to a store every day, can we deliver to them once a week? Okay, then with less effort. But it, look it to the right. Does it have low value added costs? If it does, we can eliminate them. Now, let me talk about attributes. There can be several types of attributes, not just value added and non-value added. Here's an example of a matrix, two types of attributes. The lower one is the level of importance. Think of this as the value added, but it's really kind of a spectrum. Is it a postponable activity we can stop or is it as critical? The vertical axis is how important, how well are we doing the activity? Do we exceed customer expectations or below? Each activity can then be basically put into this diagram. And notice examples of the four. If we're in the upper left, we're very, very good at something that's very unimportant. Scale back, don't do it as much. If we are basically in the bottom right, we're not very good at it, but it's really important, fix that. If we're in the upper right, we're very good at it and it meets and it's important, get better at it. And if you're in the bottom left, we're not very good at it and it's not important, perhaps a third party can do it, outsource it. So to summarize, notice I started by doing activity-based costing at the top, down the bottom, remember the expenses through the activities, piling up into the product services. Notice the number one, profit margin analysis. It also gets senior management attention. They may not be interested in process improvement. They know, eh, maybe we got some waste. They do want to know where they make or lose money. And this whole issue about which customers are more important is key. Once we have the activities, now notice number two, horizontally left to right, string them like pearls manage the processes, remove waste, reduce cycle time, raise productivity. So key points here, lean accounting can be used operationally by managers to focus on removing waste, reducing throughput cycle time, improving productivity. What activity-based costing can do is be used strategically. Notice I've underlined operationally and strategically to better understand the sources of what drives product and service lines, distribution, channel, and customer profitability. ABC models the linkages of resource expenses through those end-to-end -end processes with the activities that belong to them, to the products, service lines, and customers, and ultimately to the wealth creation of shareholders and owners. So let me start concluding, and then I'll hand it over to Ann and Dr. and Nuan for some discussion. Some of you may be saying, gee, I wonder how bad or how good our system is, our, our management accounting. Well, I have a way that you can answer that question. I created a stages of maturity diagram for the International Federation of Accountants. IFAC, which is www.ifac.org, is in New York City headquarters. They're like the United Nations of professional accounting institutes. I think there's 180 members, including in the US, the Institute of Management Accountants, the AICPA, SEMA, and so forth, okay? 
And I know there's there are people there. And I said, I can create a stages of maturity model. It's 30 pages. Again, if you go to my website, Gary Cookins, you'll be able to download the diagram. Here is the stages. I don't have time to go through it in, in, in great detail, but I'll just start you out. When we look at the historical view, looking backwards, you know, last month, last quarter, there are eight stages, okay? I will tell you that 95% of commercial companies, sadly, are a 5D or lower. When you're at a 5D, you're basically, oh, I'm doing direct material, direct labor, my direct cost. I am butter spreading that overhead. To move to a 6D is where you begin using activity-based costs just for products and service lines. 70 is when you go below the product gross profit margin line to do the include channel expenses, marketing expenses, selling expenses, customer service expenses, that profit and loss statement by customer. 8D, if you're interested in unused capacity, that's another story. I don't think there's not time to go to the right, maybe with uh, is with the or management accounting society in a future webinar, I'll talk about budgeting and planning and the like. It is really sad that most organizations are the 5D or lower. I think it's, I'm gonna get a little critical here. I think it's irresponsible of a CFO and accounting organization to not be basically using activity-based costing. And I'm now gonna mention something about this country of India. I'm gonna really get myself in trouble. There is too much of an imbalance in India accountants with external statutory reporting. It seems that's what government's interested in. Are you basically accurately closing the books? You are not putting enough emphasis in India on management accounting. And that's what's really needed for the better decisions. The external reporting that all of the imbalance and the big emphasis in India is, that's about valuation, inventory value, cost of goods sold. What management accounting is creating value for shareholders by providing insights and better decisions. To summarize, what I'm showing you here is there is a shift in the source of return on investment, financial return on investment for any company from tangible assets to in an intangible assets. What I mean by that is the return on investment is shifting from buying things like you know, machines and computers and hardware and software to an intangible asset like information. And what this diagram is showing is the return on investment from information left to right, from data to information, to knowledge, to intelligence decisions, increases exponentially from raw. The sad part though is most organizations are stuck in the first two red bubbles, raw data and standard reports. All they can answer is what happened. In some cases, the chief information officer, the IT director gives some managers some drill down software, business intelligence software like Click or Tableau or Microsoft Power BI. So they can go to a line item of an invoice or purchase order, but they're still limited to only answering what happened. Corporate performance management, including managerial accounting starts at the first blue bubble. It's modeling, costing is modeling, other things, strategy maps, which we didn't talk about are models. Now you not only know what happened, you know why did it happen. Then when we move to the predictive view, which we didn't talk about in this webinar, we just sort of talked, there'll be about budgeting and rolling financial forecasts, perhaps in a future webinar for you. Now we can look at not only what happened, why did it happen, what can happen. We can do scenario analysis, sensitivity analysis. Then we get to the farthest top, we're at optimization, the prescriptive view of all the things, choices we could make. What's the best choice we could make? I always like to say there's two types of software and like just like your brain, if you will. The historical stuff is like your reptilian brainstem, you know, controlled breathing, blinking, digesting, you know, you look like a, like a snake. The predictive view is the cerebral cortex that distinguishes human beings, if you will, from animals. So the complete vision of performance management you know, make all these gears. That's what all these things and management accounting basically supports is one of these important gears to support decisions. Think of them as spinning faster, quicker revolutions per minute. That's the RPM, you know, better, faster, cheaper. 
And then we can be safer when we bring in things like risk management and smarter when we bring in strategy maps and balance scorecard, a topic for another day. So action steps, get educated, get buy-in. Well, congratulations, you're getting educated just by attending this webinar. But getting buy-in from others, you got to start thinking about how do I persuade them to basically follow my lead, use these better methods. And I'm a big advocate, rapid prototyping, start small, think big, you know, make those first models. You're going to need to con be concerned about, pro about incentives, motivational theory to get people to change. There are two links underneath. One is on the customer profitability from the IMA magazine. The one below it will basically talk to you about other things. So theory to practice, your success depends on how well and how fast the right information intelligence gets to the right people. So there's my website. Uh, feel free to invite me in LinkedIn. I hope I've explained and I'll just summarize that it's okay the different beyond remember the title of this presentation was lean accounting versus activity-based costing a choice or blend the answer is it's not a choice you can blend them you can have two or more costing methods different types of methods for different types of users remember abc for strategic lean accounting for operational for different purposes abc for strategic decisions lean accounting for operational productivity. So I'm gonna hand it back now to Nuan or Ann, and if you wanna facilitate for a few minutes uh, before we uh, log off and everybody can go have dinner. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary. I think it was a very, very excellent presentation. And uh, uh, I don't want to uh, go through in detail because we have our experts who are there to handle it. But one thing that you mentioned was, uh, of course, uh, the role of the management accountant. Uh, it's really creating value. And I think that's something that we greatly appreciate. And I think uh, the real role of the uh, management accountant, and uh, let me now uh, 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 invite, uh, before I hand over to our moderator, Dr. Nuan, uh, Mr. Rahman, who is, I think, uh, very, very closely who had been involved with you, uh, to uh, uh, make his expert comments and thereafter for Dr. Nuan to take over and uh, go through the Q&A session and uh, any other comments that he would have. Uh, Gary, if you can kindly maybe uh, 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 remove the share screen, then we can all... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Then yeah. we can yeah. go to the... Yeah, right. Okay. Fine. Right. All fine. right. Hi, Raman. Good morning, knew, Gary. Good evening. I, Hi, how are you? I knew you 30 years ago when we had dark hair and a head of hair. <laughs> Look at us now. <laughs> so nice to um, listen to you again and again. And I really admire your uh, ever deepening and uh, ever widening enthusiasm in all these topics. Hats off to you, Gary. A fantastic presentation. The same tempo what I saw in you 30 or 40 years back. <laughs> okay, coming to the uh, couple of uh, few points uh, which I want you to react. Uh, a particular point which I want to emphasize starts from your maturity model, what you have presented, the continuum, continuum maturity model of the cost accounting implementation. One key drawback which I have observed in uh, both in Sri Lanka as well as in, in India is where I operate significantly the CFOs, the chief financial officers, their appetite for a strong or robust management accounting is very, very low. They do not see the value because their minds are full of compliance, IFRS compliance and uh, uh, reporting to the shareholders. It's extremely difficult to uh, create an appetite in their minds how to improve the maturity of cost and managed accounting in, the, in those organizations. This is a hypothesis I am stating. But very recently, we saw a window of opportunity because I work with Lakshman on this very intensively in Sri Lanka, which is integrated reporting and integrated thinking, which, is, which has taken off in Sri Lanka in a very big way. 
Me and Lakshman, we have been along with the uh, uh, the, the famous judge from South Africa, Mary, Marion King, who, who has been the, the father of the integrated reporting and thinking. He has completely bought out about the need for management accounting. He says, without management accounting framework, you cannot have a good integrated thinking and reporting. He is on our side. But what is the strategy which you offer to us to use this big opportunity and put management accounting in forefront of the organizations who are now gravitating towards integrated thinking and reporting? This is where you can give a tremendous push for this to Lakshman and me to work hard on Sri Lanka on this platform. Yeah, let me briefly, you know, one thing I didn't mention, although I think Blackman in my introduction, you know, my, my degree was engineering and I was a controller at age 27, but I'm always an engineer. And I always say I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. You got to think like an engineer when you do, you know, management accounting. Yeah. The, the issue you're talking about is the slow adoption rate of ABC. And it, the question is, what are the barriers that are slowing it? And how do you remove those barriers? One of the barriers is IT related, you know, dirty data and different hardware, you know, IBM, Dell, HP, so IT can solve that. The other barrier you're sort of alluding to is this perception barrier that, oh, it, it's too difficult to do and ABC too complicated and everybody would have to have timesheets and so they're fearful of using ABC because they think it's just, it's gonna make their job harder and I'll have to hire more people. And I hope I resolve that by showing you the rapid prototyping technique. The third and the real big bear has got nothing to do with software, nothing to do with systems, it's all people. It's change management, it's behavioral. It's things like fear of knowing the truth or other departments knowing the truth. It's fear of being measured, fear of being held accountable. Uh, resistance to change. It's just human nature. People don't like change. They like the same thing. Only babies with diapers like change. Weak leadership. There I put it out there. Maybe the executive at the top, you know, they're just not either smart enough or motivated enough to want to make the change. Now, you're, the diff more difficult question, how do we get the CFOs out of the 1960s and all of their emphasis on external reporting into the valuation emphasis. Sometimes I think you just have to shame them. <laughs> you have to basically, you know, we, you know, I don't know if that, ooh, I don't know if that's a negative thing in India, sort of, but you have to basically say, hey, you know, do we, do our managers know where we make or lose money profitably? Do we know which customers are more attractive to retain, to grow? Do we, this is called the Socratic method, like Socrates, okay? You, you start by asking questions and notice those questions are, we would call pain questions, you know, because the answers to all of those are, I don't think so. You know, do we know where we really make or lose money, including indirect expense? No, I'm not sure. Do we know which customer? I'm not, what you're doing is you're creating discomfort and dis this is change management. This is like psychology and sociology. Once you start creating enough discomfort you know, they could say, well, all right, well, how do I fix that? You know, it's kind of like, where's the lifeboat or the lifeline to this problem? Well, and then it's an education piece, you know, you, and that's where I think the, the stages of maturity, you know, it's 30 pages. And I believe in India, there's another maturity model or something, but so long answer to your quick question, how do we get CFOs into the 20th for 21st century? Mm -hmm. What other questions or comments? I think, uh, shall we, uh, Dr. Nuan, why don't you uh, maybe start your session now? Yes, yes. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Matravala, for inviting me to be the moderator of this important um, webinar on in accounting and activity-based costing. Uh, Gary, I think your presentation is uh, really interesting, insightful, and also relevant in Sri Lankan context. <laughs> now, why this is relevant? Let me give you some uh, facts. Uh, oh, all the Sri Lanka, you know, Sri Lanka is having a very progressive uh, accounting profession, as Mr. Raman and Professor Bhattabal have said, uh, where we have uh, embraced new developments in accounting, such as integrated reporting and sustainability reporting. And also Sri Lanka has been producing accountants for the world. Uh, however, the adoption of management accounting practices, especially these costing systems, um, is not uh, satisfactory in the Sri Lankan enterprises. Especially sure. studies show that uh, yeah. 
application of management accounting is mainly confined to planning and internal controls. And also they, they attribute this reason to the lack of top management awareness on the man usefulness of management accounting tools and techniques. Very correct, very correct. Yes, and also uh, there is overemphasis on uh, financial accounting based reports for decision making, even for internal decision making, which actually downplays the value of management accounting. And also these studies have highlighted that majority of the Sri Lankan organizations uh, prefer conventional management accounting tools such as budgeting or standard costing over new developments such as ABC or life cycle costing or so forth. And even Professor Vatavala, uh, you would remember that in 2013, the report of uh, Pope, the Committee on Public Enterprises, uh, highlighted that uh, Sri Lankan public sector has to embrace better costing systems and management accounting systems, especially in the Sri Lankan context. The public sector is very large because we have 1.4 million employees out of you know, 21.8 million populations. So that's a large proportion. So this, uh, this COP appointed by the parliament of Sri Lanka emphasized that the public sector organizations need to go for better costing systems to reduce losses and to minimize waste and also to close loopholes uh, for frauds and malpractices and also to improve the transparency in the public sector. So that's why I said that your presentation is uh, highly relevant in the Sri Lankan context. So I think we have uh, several questions uh, in the question and answer box. So let me take up them uh, first. Now, uh, one question is, uh, uh, can Kaizen costing be used? Uh, can, can it be linked with ABC? Can Kaizen costing be linked with oh. ABC? That's one of the first questions we have. Yeah. Hey, first, before, since you mentioned about public sector, and I don't want to basically be accused of promoting my books, but I did last year publish a book, and it's called Value-Based Management in Government. Value-Based Management in Government. The publisher is Wiley, W-I-L-E-Y. My co-author was the CFO in the United States of both the Department of Education and the Department of Labor under the President of the United States. And it has many chapters on activity-based costing for public sector uh, government. And it, you, know, you can still basically calculate citizens and, and so forth. Um, Hoshan, Kaizen, um, I'm actually on a task force with the American Society of Quality. They're kind of like quality engineers. It's very similar to the lean accounting. You know, they're still, the principles are the same. They're looking at the, if you will, the process view, the end-to-end -end view, and there's different types of processes, order to cash and delivery and so forth. And then they're, they're analyzing it. Again, the value add, non-value add, how well do we perform it, cycle time reduction. So the brief answer to the person is, of course, that's why I said different types of costs for different users for different purposes. Thank you, Gary. Um, we have another question, uh, which actually asks for the limitations of ABC. Is it uh, historical? Is it not uh, forward-looking? So what's your idea on uh, the limitations of potential limitations on, of ABC? I don't think it has any limitations. I think, I think more of the, maybe this isn't a limitation, it's that many who are implementing it over design it way too complex. And so it needs to basically be right size, just good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect, okay? In terms of the predictive view, which perhaps Lakshman at a few months from now, we can have do another seminar. When we do the predictive view, you now really need to classify the behavior of the resources as sunk, fixed, step fixed, and variable. And when you do resource capacity planning, you know, calculations, you need unit level costs. I think this was industrial engineering, first, second semester, freshman year, at Cornell, volume and mix times unit level rates equals capacity required, number and type of employees, and how much to spend with suppliers. So it, 
it not only doesn't have a limitation, it actually is a bonus by doing the historical costing to see the profit margins as a bonus. Oh, I got all these unit level rates. That's going to be valuable when I do my rolling driver based rolling financial forecast, my what if scenarios. So I don't see limitations to ABC. I see risks of not effectively implementing it. All right. Thank you, Gary. Correctly. Yes, uh, we have another question uh, that is about uh, what sort of uh, technical tools are available in famous enterprise resource planning systems such as SAP or Oracle to implement uh, lean accounting? Or, or haven't they developed uh, you know, tools yet? Um, there are about eight commercial ABC software vendors, and I think it would be inappropriate for me to provide the names. I would suggest people, because I think AN, Rahman, people can communicate with him. And AN, I think I've given you the uh, Word document that's got all of the um, providers. Quite frankly, they're all calculation engines. They're far more similar than they are dissimilar. Some of them are based out of Amsterdam. There's a really nice one in Sao Paulo, Brazil, but they've got customers and software licenses all over the world. Here's the point. Why, why I like the commercial ABC software vendors, and I've used all of them when I do, my, I do some consulting work, but now I transfer the knowledge to other consultants to do the rapid prototyping. You can export the activity costs into process diagram, process tools. And there's a lot of simple process flow charting tools, swim lanes, and the like. So that's why when I showed the first slide, I had the vertical down and the slide across by coming down using commercial ABC software, calculating the ABC cost, you got them. Now there's interactivity, export them into, you could use the word integrated reporting earlier. You know, this is integrated, export them into process flowchart tools. Thank you, Gary. Uh, there's one more question. Actually, we have two more questions. The first question is, uh, can there be any chance to reconcile ABC costing systems with the statutory reports? Um, actually, if you go to the IMA website, imanet.org, I did uh, co-author with Doug Paul an article on standard costing at ABC. And Doug, the answer is the standard costing or the regulatory statutory, if they want to be lazy, it's convenient and just use labor hours or whatever cost allocation factor that violates the cause factor, the cause and effect principle, like you know, gravity and speed of light, that's what it is. Um, they can continue to do that. What the article in the IMA magazine, it says, <clears throat> slowly but surely, you can start moving the design of the ABC model into the standard costing model. Because software is so powerful now, you know, to do inventory valuation, if you didn't have a very powerful computer, oh, so easy, let's just use all this overhead, create a, fa a burden factor, and then we'll use labor hours from our operational system. But now the software is sophisticated enough that you can move, but they don't have to be type perfectly integrated. External reporting for shareholders, internal for managers, although some external reporting has line of business so if you're, you know, you'll be falsely misleading investors if it says, well, this line of business is more profitable and this one's less one. In fact, that's not true unless you use ABC principles. We only have a couple minutes here and we won't go. It's a discourtesy. I want, to, you know, I want everybody to basically get to bed or go to lunch or go to dinner. So is there one more question or comment? Yes, I think in the interest of time, let me take uh, uh, one more question. Uh, are there any limitations in selecting uh, cost drivers in uh, ABC? Or maybe there's what a, are the challenges? Let me put that in that way. What are the challenges? A, I have a simple method for identifying activity cost drivers. You start with the activities should be defined with a verb, adjective, noun, grammar. This is like grammar, grammar school. You know, process international invoices process, internet, you know, domestic purchase orders. Notice verb, adjective, noun. 
So let's use this example of process international invoices, which incidentally, the another one we process domestic invoices. Notice just by defining those, when we actually calculate the unit cost, of course, an international invoice is going to be more time consuming and more expensive. But let's stay with the process international invoices. What would be the driver? Number of in international invoices. So if the number of international invoices increases 30%, our activity cost will go up 30%. If the number of international invoices next year goes down 20%, our activity cost. So the simple way of defining the technique of an activity driver is first define the all the activities in what's called an activity dictionary, verb, adjective, noun, and then for the driver put number of and then look at the noun in the activity dictionary, you've got your activity driver. All right, why don't you, I suggest you do some concluding remarks and yeah, we'll log uh, off. Yes, I think in the yeah, interest thanks, of time. Uh, uh, this yeah, be just the before you finish, uh, Nuan, I think there are uh, two, I think, who have just come in. Maybe I'll just give them one minute. I think there's uh, Suresh Shrestha and Venkat Raman. Just uh, one minute, if you have any comments, please make, yeah. I can't see them. Then uh, uh, I think uh, Aditi is there. Aditi, uh, you can make your comment uh, soon. Okay, Venkat Raman. Uh, yeah. Uh, good, yeah. Uh, good morning, Mr. Gherkins. Uh, good evening, all others. Uh, this German casting system is now getting popular in India. What is your opinion about it? The, the which type of casting? GPK, German, German costumes. GPK. Oh, too complicated. Yeah. I know it, 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 I mean, it has merit. It's like industrial engineering. It's really looking for unused capacity. It includes unused capacity costs. Um, I, I don't want the Germans to get mad at me. Um, you really need to be advanced. I think it's like a child with a uh, little bicycle training wheels, get your ABC and get your lean accounting and then ask yourself, is it incrementally more valuable to now advance to GPK? In other words, is the climb worth the view? You know, if you've got good enough information to make decisions where you're at, fine. GPK is a lot more sophisticated, it's like a PhD. You know, you get an MBA, getting a PhD, much more advanced, you know, does, does the company need a PhD, but it needs an MBA. So that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, okay. Aditi, uh, just. Uh... Uh, yes, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, basically, I want to uh, ask that the way you explained that lean system gets along with ABC. The blend is a very uh, useful one. So similarly, I would like to know that the lean system when it merges with Six Sigma, what effects would it give? Um, first of all, lean management is really a whole discipline in itself. The lean accounting is just sort of like, here's the accounting part of lean. Lean management has a whole bunch of, you know, pr principles for cycle time reduction. And they should, quality management should basically link with it's a cycle time reduction in the same thing. So they're really talking about the same stuff. I will mention there is another attribute, which I didn't show in my presentation called cost of quality. And if you look at the quality community, there is a way to measure cost as, as cost of conformance and cost of non-conformance. And there's this continuum prevention, appraisal, internal failure, external failure. And those can actually be decomposed down another layer every one of the activities can be tagged that way. And you could then actually get a distribution curve of a company's cost of quality from conformance to non-conformance. And that's a way that Six Sigma could actually be reflected in the management accounting system. But to answer your question, Lean and Six Sigma, they're like, uh, it's a marriage. They're, they're not the same, but they reinforce each other. Thank you, you know, uh, Gary. Uh, yeah. even, just uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, we, uh, before closing, can I uh, tell Mr. Raman to just give his final comments and after that uh, for Nuan. 
Uh, nothing, uh, nothing, nothing specific. It was a fantastic uh, session. Uh, only thing, uh, it it can throw more and more insights when people start using all these ideas. That is where we need a community in uh, Sri Lanka, users of this sort of uh, uh, developmental concepts. If that community, uh, uh, there is a mass buildup of that community in Sri Lanka, then what would happen is, it will create a, a very big movement at a country level, the way uh, you created for integrated reporting and integrated thinking. A similar energy burst is required from you for improving the cost and management accounting in Sri Lanka. If that can happen, a community starts building around with people like Gary, Nuan, and all of us working with them. It can be really useful. I think we need to move into that sort of action uh, in addition to listening to more and more presentations like people like Gary. That's what I would suggest very strongly to you. Thank you, Mr. Ravan. Uh, Dr. Nuan, you... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Watwal. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I will be very, very uh, short. Uh, I think we have discussed a lot about uh, hosting systems and the applications in, in professional accounting education and so forth. I think what is now important is to put them into practice and to move for mature hosting systems. And I think these kind of uh, seminars and workshops will be highly important in the, even in the future for our accountants to move forward in uh, aligning their hosting systems with ABC and new developments in uh, management accounting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nuan. I think, uh, as uh, Gary uh, mentioned, he wants to uh, keep to time. So uh, let me thank uh, Gary, because actually, uh, you are really taking, uh, uh, making us uh, change, you know, you are uh, really thinking of change. I think that's something we want to do from the financial accounting area where we have been looking at things to go into the management and costing area, which will really be beneficial uh, to the society, to the companies, and also uh, maybe increase their bottom line. Now that's uh, the most important thing. And as uh, Mr. Raman mentioned, uh, we've uh, taken this uh, value creation with the integrated reporting, now we can combine with what we have done on the ABC and the other systems that we have. So I think uh, you have really uh, taken us uh, to the next level, how we can go into detail uh, to achieve this. So once again, let me thank you, Gary, because as you said, uh, you are uh, doing a great service to us. Uh, you are prepared to do another seminar for us. I'm sure that's the way that we can uh, take it forward and we have our uh, uh, Dr. Nuan, who's been really uh, very, very helpful, I think, uh, although he's based in Australia at the moment, I'm sure he's been coming back, but he can always participate because we are using the uh, digital technology now. It's everything is digital, you know, because whether it is education or examinations or uh, any practical uh, programs that we are doing are all on digital, and you are also here uh, thankful to the digitalization that is there. So I think. Uh, Mr. Raman is also closely associated with us on the cost and management accounting standards. I would invite uh, Dr. Nuan also to join that. And uh, maybe with the advice of uh, Gary, uh, that we will be able to really to make it uh, go. Because one thing that Nuan mentioned was that uh, most of the companies are really not using this. They are still using financial uh, accounting and not being able to differentiate between that. And as you uh, mentioned in your graph, the indirect costs are increasing. And they're adding this to the cost and saying that is the cost. That is really not the uh, true picture. The society is suffering as a result of that. So let us uh, start with this. And I think uh, we can bring in uh, much more meaning to what we have done. So Gary, let me thank you once again from uh, uh, our certified management accountants of Sri Lanka, all our members and all our participants, and of course, our experts who have been helping us. And uh, for uh, making available your valuable time, I know it's early morning, uh, 7.30 now, it must be 8.30 or uh, 9. So thank you very much. And we appreciate very much uh, the I contribution that you have made and look forward to your future, uh, maybe uh, involvement with us. And I'm sure, once these things are settled, you will be able to come and be with us physically. Thank you very I much. Well, I, and, I, welcome uh, it. It, I, I welcome it. It's my honor and it's a privilege to present to you. So goodbye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Raman. Thank you, Dr.